Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome back to the Lockdown Litfest studio. As ever, we hope that you are safe. We hope that you're keeping well. Um, we hope that you are being careful and those around you are being careful also. I'm delighted today to bring you um, somebody or to be in conversation with somebody that I'm a huge, huge fan of and a great admirer of the work that he does, which is not just about his writing and his photography, but he is, of course, Leveson Wood, who's an explorer, a writer, a photographer. Before his entrance into travel documentary, Leveson spent a number of years as an officer in the British Parachute Regiment and served in Afghanistan, fighting against the Taliban insurgents in Helmand, Kandahar and Zabal, um, and is still a reservist in the British Army. He's a fellow of both the Royal Geographical Society and the Explorers Club, and an ambassador for a number of charities, including UNICEF, the Soldiers Charity, who's also the Army Benevolent Fund, and Tusk Trust. He's written an enormous number of books, which we're going to discuss across the course of the next half an hour or so. But uh, most importantly, we're going to be talking about The Last Giants, his latest work published by Hodder and Stoughton, The Rise and Fall of the African Elephant. Levison Wood, it's a huge pleasure to be able to say very warm welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, talking to you from a virtual studio, which is actually based in the heartland of rural Warwickshire. Um, whereabouts are you? I am in London, so I'm I'm still in the uh, in the thick of us, and uh, this very strange time in which we live. <laughs> it is yes, it's, I mean it's very odd for all of us. Are you safe? Are you well? Are you are you being looked after, and you've got people to look after? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm I'm in a very uh, very lucky position. I've I've um, been doing a bit of volunteering actually, so I'm kind of being out and about and um, seeing what's going on. So uh, yeah, not not bad actually. Thanks. Good, delighted to hear it. Can we come back to really where you started? Because I'm very interested in this transition of you sort of being a professional explorer through um, serving with the British Army and how that sort of segued into becoming um, an explorer and somebody who was very interested in the ground over which you walk. Um, I remember your book, Walking the Nile, which was the huge bestseller, uh, Sunday Times bestseller. Um, tell, can you tell us how that started? Well, I think it just goes back to a fascination with all things exploration, travel. That was my first love before I joined the army. In fact, you know, I studied um, the history of travel literature at university. So a deep interest and curiosity in overland journeys. Um, when I was 22, I, you know, when I had just graduated, I decided to hitchhike the, the Silk Road from in England to India. Um, and, and the army and, uh, and that experience really was, was kind of um, almost like a transition from one phase of traveling as a student backpacker to doing it as a, as a professional guide and, and traveler and explorer. Um, and, and I kind of went through a number of incarnations, really. When I left the army 10 years ago, I set up a little guiding company. So I was, you know, taking people on adventures and um, expeditions around the world. I worked for a number of charities out in Africa where I got lots of experience in project management, um, all the while developing my you know, own skills as a photographer. And um, as, as a lot of young writers do, you know, I was sort of writing little articles for newspapers, magazines, guidebooks, um, and just building a little portfolio of, of, of stuff that I'd, I'd sort of experienced, really. And, uh, and then the Nile, I suppose, was where it transitioned from being a bit of an ad hoc, part hobby, part job, to something that really um, enabled me to take it off as a full-time uh, career, I suppose. And, and my feet haven't touched the ground since. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, you become... What I most admire about you is your brilliant ability to communicate the sense of place that you're in, both in print, in terms of you know, writing, writing on a page, but also through TV documentaries. But you mentioned something in your first answer, which is a traveler and explorer. Where's the boundary between those two, to your mind? What makes a traveler a traveler? What makes an explorer an explorer? What's the difference? Well, it's an odd term, isn't it, explorer? It sort of conjures up these images of pith helmets and khaki shorts and uh, you know, big, big twirly mustaches. Well, um, it, it was a term that I was never particularly comfortable with early on because what does it mean, you know? And uh, but I suppose as as I sort of developed um, a way of doing things and a way of thinking and, and refined 
um, I suppose, a style of writing. It's given me an opportunity to really explore what exploration means. And I think in today's age, you know, in the modern world, it's about documenting this moment in time and then sharing that with others, not just for the sake of posterity, but, um, but really so that we can hopefully explore some of the themes of, you know, of the age and, uh, and, and affect change and, and look at the causes that are really important. And so exploration, you know, is something that anyone can be a part of and lots of people can, can contribute to in different ways. So I think there's one thing traveling for the sake of it, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love just going off, whether that's just on a holiday, a couple of weeks on the beach or some backpacking. Um, and I suppose exploration is when it turns into a, there's a reason to do it. There's, a, there's an under, underlying cause or whether it's part of your work. And I think, um, and I think for me, that is the, is the difference between the two, I guess. I like that distinction a lot. Can you talk us a little bit? I remember year, back in the day, I think one of the first interviews I did for you was for the Edward Stanford Travel Writing Festival. Oh, you mm. were talking about your book, Walking the Himalayas, which was a huge success. Can you just talk us, I seem to remember you spoke very eloquently about the importance of having your boots on the ground and the people you meet along a walk such as the one along the Himalayas. Can you talk us through that a little? Well, walking has been something that I suppose has defined uh, the last seven or eight years for me. Um, I never set out to break records or um, do it just for the physical challenge. I mean, that's certainly a part of the appeal. But what I found is that by putting one foot in front of the other, by going off the main you know, trails, um, it's, it's about the encounters. It's about those interactions with people. That's what makes the journeys worthwhile for me. And when you're on foot, you share some of the vulnerabilities that the local people do in whatever form that comes, whether that's environmental or from uh, the environment, from the wildlife, it could be anything. Um, and as a result, the people, the local people that you are going to likely to meet along the way tend to treat you less as a foreigner, less as a tourist and more you know, as a, as a fellow human being and you get invited into homes and you have these amazing serendipitous encounters with people that you probably wouldn't get even if you're on a bicycle or anywhere there's a barrier, whether that's a vehicle of any description really, um, it, it, it breaks those down. And it just means that you're forced to talk to people. Sometimes, you know, you, it's the last thing you want to do if you've been walking for weeks or months. Um, but by doing that, you, you really have no choice. And I think that's where the real beauty, because there's a commitment in walking, traveling at the slowest pace that you cannot get with any other way of travel. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I love it, because it, uh, you, you're put in positions that you, you simply can't get in any other way. I seem to remember a story you once told me about, was it walking across Russia and a man and a bottle of vodka who extended extraordinary hospitality to you? <laughs> well, that was, that was back when I was, I think I was 22, yeah. I, um, it was in Georgia. I was, uh, I'd, uh, I'd, I just hitchhiked uh, all the way across Russia, the Southern Caucasus, Caucasus Estates into Georgia. And I was 22, I had no money, so I was just sleeping at the side of the road. And um, it was about midnight or something, and I remember sleeping in a bus shelter. And, uh, and this gentleman who was who had obviously had a few too many vodkas came up to me and started shouting at me. I thought, oh dear, I'm, I'm in trouble now. But he was actually just being friendly, and I, I was in no position to say no. So he invited me back to his his little farmhouse, and um, we we I think we drank an entire bottle of this homemade brew together. And then the following morning, when I was about to say thank you and, and leave. Um, he'd already been up since four o'clock tending to his, you know, his horses and things. And he came back for breakfast and then slammed another bottle of vodka down. And that was it. We, we had to start drinking again. And this went on for three days. Every time I tried to escape, there was no escape. So on the third day, I thought, right, this is it. I need to get out of here. So I, um, I went down to the front door really early when he was out looking after his horses. And, um, the, you know, the, the problem was I opened the door, there was an enormous guard dog and I couldn't get out, I couldn't get out. So I ended up having to like climb out the back bedroom window and uh, scale, scale over the neighbor's fence just to escape. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you, you, we have these encounters of wrong foot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, I've, I've not traveled anywhere near to the extent that you have, and I'm certainly not comparing myself to you, I wouldn't dream of doing so, but I'm aware that sometimes crossing national borders can't, it has its own sort of nervous tension. Have you had any um, any moments where you think, oh, this is uh, this is not looking too happy, especially when you've got 
sort of you know young commissioned or, 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 or enlisted soldiers with uh, who are a little trigger happy. Oh, it's happened plenty of times. Um, you know, the last journey I made around the Middle East a couple of years ago. You know, travelling on on some of these borders through Yemen and uh, Lebanon in, in in Syria. There were lots and lots of hairy moments where um, you've really got to have your your wits about you because you just don't know. And uh, you might have all the paperwork in place, but all it takes is is like you say one one young lad who's maybe had a few too many with his with his gun, and he, and and things can get very hairy. And um, you know, I. Crossing from Sudan into Egypt on my Nile journey, I ended up uh, being interrogated for many hours. I had all my camera equipment taken off me, and um, I remember they, <clears throat> the, the Egyptian uh, security on on the southern border in those days was particularly um, on edge. And basically, it's totally forbidden to take any photographs of anything that's considered a strategic asset, and that can be a bridge, it can be the Aswan Dam, you know, it's just a big lump of concrete that you can see from Google Earth, but um, I'd taken a few photos of this as I was walking around Lake Lake uh, NASA, and uh, I remember thinking, oh dear, now they've got my cameras, if they if they see there's a picture on, of this dam, um, that's it, they might, they're probably going to take all my kit and maybe arrest me, so um, you've got to have little tricks up your sleeve for moments like this, and when they said, show me what photos you've got, I scrolled all the way back to the beginning of my memory card. And I thought the only thing to do is, is, is try to bore them to tears. So I, I went through and found all these photographs of camels and, and palm trees and went at great lengths to explain my deep love for, uh, for this particular camel. And uh, anyway, I, I spent about a good seven or eight minutes on each photograph, at which point these policemen were so bored that they just didn't bother with the second half of the file. <laughs> it's all about coping mechanism and situational awareness, field conditions. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want you to sort of reveal any trade secrets, but of course, walking for yourself with a notebook and a camera is one thing. You are now increasingly and incredibly well known for the TV documentaries that you made on some of the walks that you've done. Can you just give us a little bit of insight into how that changes the dynamic of how you approach a walk? Because I would imagine it requires a lot more planning, a lot more logistics. And of course, you're not so much on your own, which changes the dynamic hugely. Sure. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork um, involved when you try and take cameras into countries, when you're filming openly, um, getting film permits and, and the like can be a very lengthy process. You know, and I often plan four, five, six months ahead before even setting off. Um, to be able to do that. Um, and then when you're in the country, of course, you know, if you're going around, it's all well and good going around with a tiny little camera, but the moment you've got a crew there yeah. uh, with tripods and sound, you know, microphones and all the rest of it, then it, it's a very different prospect. So first off, I try and reduce that wherever possible. And we go as light as possible. My journey around the Middle East, we, we opted to go um, with the minimalist kit so that we weren't, look you know looking like a film crew you know you, you you can sort of to the passing observer just look like a bunch you know a couple of guys on holiday so i know i try and keep it to two or three people in the crew maximum really because any more than that it becomes very unwieldy sometimes that's not possible if you're if you're making um the last the last film i made walking with elephants you know you do need those extra elements to capture the wildlife and uh you need the sound and, and so on so it's a bit more of a, an unwieldy sized gang um but it is it, it, you, you've really got to relate to the you know what the situation is on the ground and uh, if you're in a, a troublesome area where the, you know the, there is a security risk and you need to get out of there quick you do not want 15 people with three cars and a big micro boom and all the rest of it following you around you know you just want you know one guy who's got the relevant experience who you can trust so it's just i i handpick my teams and it's it's, it's all about people for me and, and it's making sure that you only work with people that you trust and can rely on and and that you know you get on with as a team because you're in each other's pockets for weeks if not months of the time and you've got to have a laugh you've got to you've got to get on so i it's for me it's it's a lot more than just a job you know it's uh, it's a way of life and if you're going to spend that amount of time with people um you've got to make sure they're the right right guys for the job really well uh, this well described what i like uh, more recently is the fact that you're using the experience that you have gained and the access and the communication skills that you have to really sort of narrow in on some very, very good causes 
Um, and I said in the introduction, of course, you know, that your latest book is The Last Giants, um, which is subtitled, uh, I've forgotten now, The Rise and Fall of the African Elephant. Um, is it Tusk Trust that you're a, a trustee or a patron of? Yeah, 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 that's right. I'm an ambassador for uh, the Tusk Trust. Um, it's a great charity. I, I work a lot with different African charities that, that yeah. work in the field of conservation. But yeah, you're right. It's um, what I found with these journeys. It's a great platform to to raise awareness about issues and conservation. Is something I've always been passionate about, and 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 particularly elephants. Um, I remember going when I was a ten year old kid. My dad took me to um, an exhibition. Uh, of the artist David Shepherd, yeah, and uh, I remember thinking, even as a kid, wow, this guy gets to travel all over Africa, um, painting elephants, and and that's what I want to do when I grow up. And whilst I didn't become a particularly good painter um, in my own way, I feel as though I've I've finally been able to to do that and, and making a series about elephants. This is not just a wildlife documentary; it's not natural history in the traditional sense. Um, you know, I turn the camera around and show the the human interaction. I show that that competition for resources, and um, it's an exploration of all the the issues that elephants and other species face um, in the modern times. So I think it's really important to do that. It's, there's no point in just showing the sugar coated ideal of what it's you know what it would be lovely. Yeah. For, for, for wildlife to live in, but it's not always like that. And um, if we're going to really do something about um, conservation and preserving endangered species, then you need to show the reality. And, and I think that's what this documentary does. It's but not in an entirely gloomy way, and it's not entirely negative, because there's some great stories of hope that come out of it as well. Talk us through this. So where did you film it, and what have you learned? What did you know about African elephants? What is the situation they're in in terms of endangerment? Because, of course, you know, farmers, their, their habitat is slowly being encroached on by humanity, it's the conflict between you know human agricultural endeavour and the Africans, uh, the African elephants' natural habitat that seems to be the pinch point in this. Can you talk us through what you learned in the making of this documentary? Where did you do it, by the way? So the, the documentary uh, was filmed in, in Botswana. Um, right. The reason for that is that Botswana has the highest uh, population of elephants in Africa. There's 120,000. Uh, for lots of different reasons, not least because it's traditionally been a very safe country. Um, it's got a low, relatively small human population. And a lot of the elephants from neighboring countries like Angola and Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia, elephant populations there have been reduced massively because of war and poaching. So elephants have sort of converged um, in Botswana. And also because it's got the Okavango Delta, one of Africa's last pristine wildernesses. So the idea was to follow um, in the footsteps, footsteps of the biggest migration of elephants in Africa towards the delta during the dry season when, when the elephants need to find water. <clears throat> and, um, and that's what I did, you know, walking embedded effectively with herds of elephants as they were walking towards the delta. It was a beautiful experience. Um, I knew probably, you know, in terms of my, my knowledge of elephants before this particular journey, um, you know, only so much as anyone else that's been on a few safaris. You know, I, they're beautiful creatures that that really intrigued me. Um, the book that I wrote is very separate to the film, though. It's it's it's, a, it's an entirely pan Africa look at where elephants came from, their evolutionary and biological history, um, what's happened over the last few hundred years in terms of the you know the, the, the dynamics within Africa, the huge global trade in ivory during the 19th century, and then what's happened in more recent times um, in terms of the human population growth. So um, that book is, is not just anecdotes of my own encounters with elephants over the last 10 years or so, but also a, a much wider look at, at the problem and what we can do to help to save elephants. And what do you think the prognosis is? Are you hopeful? Well, if you look at the statistics, then even in my lifetime, you know, elephant numbers have halved from yeah. just over a million to 420,000 now, which that doesn't look very good. The reality is um, that as the human population grows, um, the African the, you know, human population is going to treble. Um, in the next 30 years. Um, and what that means is there's less space. And, and for the megafauna like elephants, they need a lot of room to, to feed and roam and follow their ancestral 
trails, um, you know, these routes, these corridors that have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Elephants need to drink water every day, more or less. Um, so what does that mean? Well, as, as villages grow and, and there's more mouths to feed, then people need to plant more crops. And so every week, more and more wilderness land is, is eaten into by agricultural land. And it's not just local people who are trying to feed their families. It's, it's the big corporations. You know, we in the West are going to take a huge burden of responsibility um, because of our constant desire for, for new, you know, the cash crops, you know, not just Africa, but across the world, look at the Amazon and how much, um, how much of that forest is being hacked down for soya plantations and beef and cattle farming. So habitat loss is the, is the new big problem. It's, it's probably a greater, you know, certainly a, an equal problem to poaching, if not greater. So how do you manage that? Well, I think the only realistic way, if, if we're serious about saving wildlife, is the creation of these international parks, mega parks, where you link up national parks with corridors and, and allow elephants to move. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the consequences, the repercussions of that mean that some people are going to have to not be allowed to live there. And that doesn't go down well in, in those host countries. Exactly, as you say, with the, you know, with the expected population growth, um, as you say, three times the population in Africa in a few years' time, that's going to be terrifying. How can people help? I mean, because we, we've all watched David Attenborough, we've watched you, we've watched a lot of natural history programmes that have been beautifully shot, beautifully produced, and just beautifully made with messages across the last few years. But as we're sitting on our sofas watching this, how, how would you advise people to help? Is it by supporting the World Wildlife Fund for Nature? Is it by getting involved with charities uh, like Toss Trust and so on? Does, does the money that people give actually go to serve those on the ground? And as I ask that, I'm sort of reminded of the fact that one of the support mechanisms, of course, is tourism. People going to the big game parks, spending their money for entries, paying the guides and so on and so forth, which mm. puts petrol into the cars, which puts gas in the cars, which allows the game wardens to be able to protect the animals and so on and so forth. But of course, under lockdown, that's not going to happen. So they, I assume they're going to be in difficulty. Yeah, it's been a huge problem with, with lockdown. It's had a massive impact on the tourism industry, which, as you rightly said, you know, is, is one of the biggest... Um, helps to conservation because because that's what puts the um, bread on the table for the for the rangers. That's what um, pays the wages of of all the staff that work in there. And when people are desperate, that's when poaching um, increases. And we've seen a huge spike in poaching yeah. um, over the last few weeks. So um, that really is a very very big concern. So I suppose what people can do is is continue to support those conservation charities. We have a tendency when something like this hits to, to only look inward and we need to remember there's a big wide world out there and whilst our eyes are taken off the, you know, averted our gaze, then then bad things can and will happen. So we need to continue to support and, and contribute and financially help those organisations that are, you know, fighting this good fight. Um, when does the series start to go out, uh, Leveson? Uh, it goes out this Sunday. So uh, 10th of May, and it's a three-part series. So it's Sunday, 9 o'clock on Channel 4. And the book is out now. And the book is out now. Can we come to your photography for a bit? Because I like that you mentioned David Shepard. And I have, the moment you said that name, I have all those images in my head of those beautiful paintings. Um, but you've been no slouch when it comes to your own photography. You had, um, was it the photographic exhibition Visions of Africa at the Royal Opera Arcade in Pall Mall, London. And do I remember right, you had a solo show, your first solo show, Ground Truth which was like a Mayfair's most successful exhibition in quite some years. I mean, you're a very, you have an eye for an image. Um, photography is always been a passion. I, you know, I really enjoy it. It's, um, it's something that I took up really when I left the army as a way of um, just being creative, I suppose. And because of all the places I've traveled to, I thought why it would be a crying shame not to try and learn the, the art. And, um, and that's what I've done and have a, had a couple of, exhibitions and I've actually got a, a photography book coming out um, in September which is a sort of collation um, of uh, the last 10 years work really for me and, and I'm really excited about um, about what that will be because it, it was it was tough trying to reduce some somewhere in the region of 50,000 images down to 250 so uh, but I'm very excited to to have that come out and uh, it's my first photography book and um, I, I hope people will be pleased with the results. Well, congratulations on that. I mean, I've seen some images, and you are one, one hell of a photographer. 
There's something you did, I read in the notes, I think it was on your website, which intrigues me. Um, and if you can't talk about it, then just tell me to shut up. But if you can, mm. I'd be delighted to hear. You're still a reservist in the BA in 77 X-ray, is that right, Brigade? So yeah, I'm still in the still in the reserves, do do my bit now and again. Um it's been quite busy actually over the over the last few weeks with the COVID response. You know, the yeah. British Army's really been helping out with um lots of assistance to the NHS and, and across the country with the testing and, and so on. So uh so yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've tried to stay involved with um, over the last 10 years since leaving the regular army. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an organisation I'm very proud to be a part of. Well, the thing that intrigued me, and if I, my facts are wrong, then I apologise, but I've heard tell that you went on exercise to Japan, and it's the yeah. first time the British Army has had a joint exercise with Japanese forces. I'm intrigued to know, how, one, how it came about, and two, what it was like. Um, yeah, no, that was uh, not last year, the, the year before, um, October 2017, I think it was, yeah. Um, it, uh, so my grandfather was in, in the Second World War fighting against the Japanese in Burma. And in 19, at the end of 1945, he was deployed to Japan as part of the occupying force where he stayed for uh, a further two years. So I'd always been fascinated by Japan. And um, so the opportunity came up a couple of years ago um, to be a part of the first ever British Japanese training because you know the Americans have been uh, been working there with the Japanese um, for for quite some time, but they've never partnered with anybody else, certainly on on Japanese soil. So um, so I went out uh, to to be a part of that historic exercise, and it's um, it was an amazing uh, opportunity to work with um, you know. I, you know the, the 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 army that my ground had fought against, and it's it goes to show how we can reconcile within just a couple of generations. And it was and it was a really amazing experience. Lovely people, and, um, and I actually managed to get a couple of days off to go and uh, I took the bullet train down to Tokushima, where my grandfather was based, and went to go and see uh, the town in which he was living for two years. That must have been an incredibly poignant moment, Leveson. Really, really was. Yeah. No, I felt I felt very very privileged to be able to go and do that. Did you know your grandfather? Did you talk to him? Yeah, I mean, he passed away when I was 21. But I remember, you know, growing up on his stories of, of the war. And he was one of my biggest inspirations for, for travel. Because I remember, you know, he was a, a young lad from the Potteries who at the age of 18 was called to go and fight. And he'd never been anywhere beyond uh, Stoke-on-Trent before. So to go, you know, on the, on the on a, what a, you know, on a ship to Cape Town into India and to the Far East must have been a hell of an adventure. Good Lord, how extraordinary. Listen, you've had so much experience exploring, so much experience traveling. You've won, you know, Adventure Travel Books of the Year awards. You've, 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 you've earned your stripes. Can you give our audience a couple of tips for those who maybe are thinking not going away to go and sit on the, a beach somewhere or mm. walk around Lake Como or do anything like that, but are looking to have their holidays hopefully here within the UK? Yeah. Your must-haves, if you're packing a tent, if you're packing all you need to go on a walking holiday, what, what are the three things that Leveson Wood does not travel without? <laughs> and right. Well, on through. <laughs> if I'm gonna, yeah. If I'm gonna travel in the UK, I, you know, I, I, I love just packing light and seeing where the wind takes me. I know you're supposed to plan and prepare and all this stuff, but if I know I'm going somewhere where it's probably gonna be okay, I love the serendipity of just going with a with a small day sack, like a tiny little tent, a one man tent or two man if you go with somebody else, and um, and off you go. And you know, I always go with um, with a compass in case my uh, in case my Google Maps breaks down or whatever. Um, but you don't need very much, you know. You don't. You just take a take a bit of food, take your sort of your, you know your snack bar, and off you go. And as long as you've got enough water and some warm kit, you're going to survive. You're going to be all right. And, and a lighter, just in case you need to make a fire. Um, and that's actually the one, probably the one survival time, uh, genuine like sort of you know Bear grill style survival moment I had was in the in the Himalayas a few years back when I was with my mate Ash. Ash Bardwash and we were we were somehow separated from our we had a whole uh, we had a guide with a load of mules carrying our equipment and um, we took a wrong turn through this forest and we thought oh it's easy enough we had our map and we thought we'd rejoin the trail a couple of miles ahead and we didn't and it starts to get dark 
and we made the fatal error of t- trying to take a shortcut. And we ended up at the bottom of this ravine um, the, where there was a gushing river and what had, we thought there was a bridge on the map had been washed away and we couldn't climb back out. We were so exhausted. And the only thing we had with us was uh, water. I mean, we could have got water from the river, but that was, that was one thing. And um, we didn't have any warm kit. We were completely exhausted. It was good. We knew it was going to go down to about minus five. Ooh. So I was lucky I found a lighter in my pocket so we could make a little fire. Because if we hadn't, then we'd have probably been frozen to death right now. So always carry a lighter. <laughs> always carry a lighter. That's a good bit. Of, that's a good tip. I mean, you've been everywhere. You know, Himalayas, across Russia, South America, and so on and so forth. Is there, is there a frontier that you've got your eye on? You think, actually, that deserves to be walked. It deserves to have me walk on it. What's your, what's your, <laughs> what's your target, Neverson? Well... Uh, you know what? There's still lots of places I've not been to. I've not really spent a great deal of time in South America. I'd love to do a trip through South America. I mean, I've, I've been to Brazil, I've been to Colombia, but I've not been to Peru. I've not been to Ecuador. So there's, there's lots of places. Uh, whether or not I walk there, I don't know. I've taken. I've recently taken up motorbiking, Paul. So I'm uh, I'm a keen yeah. motorcyclist now. So I might I might actually do a sort of Che Guevara style uh, road trip across South America. It'd be great fun. Haven't you and McGregor and Charlie Borman already done that for you, though? They have, they have. I know they, they always beat me to it. They do, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, there's a reason. There's a reason we we go to places. There's I don't think there's anything that's original really in <laughs> in these sorts of trips. But it's about how you do it, and it's about your own personal experience. And just because somebody's done it before doesn't mean you um, you can't go and do it and have a wonderful time as well. Last thing for me, really, and it takes you to a place that. I hear these two words and it just conjures up the romance of travel and from Blashford Snell to present day. And the word is Darien Gap. But when you didn't mm. go to Colombia, you did the Darien Gap. Can you just talk us through what your expectation was of it and how the reality was? Yeah, I mean, the Darien Gap is is like this sort of holy grail for exploration. I mean, it's this, for those that don't know, it's just a gap uh, in between the Pan American Highway of, of pretty much pristine wild jungle between Panama and uh, Colombia. And there's a lot of reasons that it's not really been developed because, the, the, well, one, it's very mountainous and very wet, lots of rivers, so you can't really build a road through it. And two, it's inhabited by lots of um, narco traffickers and um, people smugglers. And so tricky one to get through. I'm sure it was very a lot trickier for, for Blashers back in the... 70s when he did it but um, even even nowadays it's very tricky to get the permission from the relevant authorities on both sides of the border not to mention the tribes who live in the middle to pass through and um, I was lucky to sort of take a take a route along the coast um, but it was fascinating absolutely wild you know you're in uh, one one of my favorite um, ever souvenirs that I ever brought back from any of my trips was it was in the middle, middle of the Daring Gap we came to this village where you know the tribes it was called the um the wunan tribe they you know they wear grass skirts they're covered in tribal henna tattoos and things like that and one of the, this little old lady came to me with a with a sort of ra- a piece of linen with something in it and she said you know through a translation would you like to buy a thunderbolt i was like excuse me what's it <laughs> i was like she was like would you want to buy a thunderbolt I was like, what's a what's a thunderbolt she's like you know when the lightning strikes a tree explodes and knocks the tree down we dig out the thunderbolt so i've never heard of this before so she opened it and this remarkable thing it was shaped in a perfect triangle very very sharp uh pe- sort of petrified fossil i thought wow you know what is this and then i kind of had an idea what it was but she she was determined this was a a, a thunderbolt and what it actually was was a megalodon tooth of a of a prehistoric shark dating back some 30 million years. And I tried, I thought, I'll try and explain this. And I said, oh, this is, a, this is a, a, a dinosaur shark. And she looked at me as if I was mad. And trying to explain the concept of a, never mind a dinosaur shark from 30 million years ago, but a shark, this is a woman who'd never seen the sea. Yep. She didn't know what the sea was. So to, to explain that Panama was underwater 30 million years ago and filled with 30-meter sharks was pointless. So I just said, I'd love to buy your uh, Thunderbolt. So I've now got a Megalodon tooth in my, uh, in my house that's sort of uh, this big. It's brilliant. Well, the <laughs> next time you're walking across the desert, do you know what fulgurites are? 
Fulgurite. Uh, yeah. Are these are these the sort of the fish that are pressed into the? No, a fulgurite is where no. lightning strikes sand in the desert and fuses Sorry. the silicon in the sand into something that looks a bit like a fossilized shark tooth. And with my geological hat on, I've always oh, wow. tried and find fulgurites. So you can actually. I mean, she's not entirely wrong. She's not wrong. Ah, there we go. There's such a thing as a, as a, as, as, as a fulgurite, which is like a you know like a like a um, a thunderbolt. Wow. Let's come back. Can we just for the last two minutes come back to the book and the documentary? So people are going to watch the documentary, Sally Botswana, and 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 shows your research and developments, and read the Last Giants. What's the call to arms? What would you like people to do if they're motivated? They read this, saying, you know, this has to change. We need to protect elephants. What's the call to arms you want people to rally around? Well, I think there's lots of things that people can do. Firstly, the easy thing is obviously to support those charities that are doing this work, uh, whether that's financially or otherwise, um, to, so that they're able to continue to, to support conservation in, in these, particularly in these tricky times. Um, I think we can all do a lot more um, to improve how we are behaving sustainably, making sure we buy products from from ethically sourced um you know companies and, and the like um and i think that we all just need to be a bit more mindful of, of our of our sort of behavior generally um supporting tourism go to places once this is all over and you have the opportunity you know let's let's just go back and, and go and support these uh these countries that need it the most through tourism because if that disappears um, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that um, so will elephants. So we've got to really do what we can to, to all play our part. Here, here, and amen to that, Leveson. Uh, for those of you listening carefully, you probably heard what sounded like a ghost behind me. It's not. I'm in rural Warwickshire, uh, and the neighbour in the house where I'm staying has a malamute, which thinks it's a wolf. So if you hear <laughs> a strange howling, uh, it's a wolf-like malamute next door to me. Um, Leveson, thank you so much for coming to join us. Thank you for taking the time. We really, really appreciate it. And on behalf of the Lockdown Lit Fest audience, can I say thank you? It's a fantastic book. I very much look forward to seeing the documentary. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Leveson Wood, who you know really cares about the lands through which he travels, and as you will know through his writing and through his photography, his latest book is entitled Walking... Uh, no, it's not called Walking with Elephants. I keep wanting to call it Walking with Elephants. It's not. It's called The Last Giants, The Rise and Fall of the African Elephant. It's out now, and if you are watching it on a platform other than through the Lockdown Litfest website, may I direct you to www.lockdownlitfest.com and on Leveson's author the page you'll find a buy button for the book the last chance the rise and fall of the african elephant which is published by hodden stone and is a very very fine work thank you leverson for joining us thank, thank you Paul. thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining us too we hope as ever that you are well that you're keeping safe and that you're being careful thank you for coming to see us cheerio <laughs>